Hi, this is KZSU Stanford 90.1 FM. We have Neil Richter on the line. Neil, are you there? I am indeed. Awesome. So the topic right now is ICO and compliance. Um, Neil, why don't you tell us your story? Sure, I'd be happy to. Awesome. So Thank I you. work at a, no problem. I work at a company called Identity Mind, and what we do is help com uh, companies do what's an ICO or initial calling offering. Uh, so but before I did all this, my background was consulting for risk and compliance, and then I kind of fell into the world of virtual currencies, and I fell deeper into this latest thing called an ICO, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Thank you, Neil. Um, so Neil's the director of product management at Identity, Identity Mind Global, and he is responsible for building software products that help companies comply with AML regulations and reduce risk. Um, and I share a little bit of Neil's background as um, counsel at PayPal for more than six years, um, and then also working on some blockchain um, as well. So um, I'm really excited about this. Um, call or chat <laughs> um, so let's let's just go straight into it what the heck is an ICO <laughs> so there's two good answers to that the first thing ICO stands for initial coin offering but what it really is is a way for a business to raise money so if you ever hear someone talk about an ICO and you ask, think like oh I wonder what that is and how it works it's just very simply a way for a business to raise money uh, Typically, it's been done. It's been done in the crypto space, and there's been a blockchain component, although it's not necessary. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, all it is is amazing new way for businesses to raise money um, quickly, easily, in a way they've never been able to do before. Um, I just talk about it as distributed investing. Um, <laughs> kind of, I just made it up. I'm not sure, you know, what the industry call it, right? They call it ICO. But basically, a bunch of people can um, buy these tokens. And I guess you know, we're talking about compliance today. And as we're talking about compliance, we are talking about laws and regulations. Um, so, you know, when we, I, I guess, you know, when we, when our friends and families invest in a startup, they get something called you know, stock, um, and those stock goes, you know, up and up or down in value, um, and we fundraised um, in Kickstarter or Indiegogo, um, then, you know, our family and friends, they get, you know, whatever that is defined um, by the company, you know, like they can get t-shirts or um, a lifetime of services and, and whatnot, right? So what do people get, you know, when what do friends, friends and families get, you know, for regarding an ICO or pertaining to an ICO? Right. So it's a little bit interesting, a little bit different than how it works normally in that usually if Michelle and I have a company together and we rate issue stock, right, uh, then whoever holds that stock owns part of the company and they may receive dividends. Uh, there's also the Kickstarter model where you don't own any part of the company, but we'll give you, you know, examples like essentially what we're building or we'll give you t-shirts or <laughs> thank yous, et cetera, right? So those are like the two ways that, you know, people are kind of understand both of those models. Uh, and ICO is, a little, is different than both of those in an interesting in its own way in that you don't give out equity in your company. You give out what's called a utility token. And all that means is you're giving out coins. So an ICO is an initial coin offering. So what you're doing is you're giving coins to people and these coins have a utility. So for example, if Michelle conducts her, her own ICO on herself, that, that token could be worth 10 seconds of Michelle's time. And she could then go and sell those on the market and people would buy them uh, because they want to spend time with her. And then what would happen is those coins will go up and down in price depending on how many people want to spend time with Michelle. Hmm. I hope a lot of people do. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> so, so when um, I, I wanted to go straight in, you know, um, the Howey test and talk a little bit about it, um, since we're going to talk about compliance, and you know, and then the biggest issue on ICO is whether it's considered security, right? And and I guess you know, for the non-financial people, you know, what is security and what does it mean? Right, so security is it's complex, but for a simple answer, think of a security as a stock. Uh, 
Um, so we use the, the example of Airbnb, right, which is the, the P2P hotel app that a lot of us know and love. So Airbnb is a very large company worth billions of dollars, and it still hasn't gone public or had an IPO, initial public offering, mm -hmm. because the requirements are so onerous, they don't want to go through it. Uh, likewise, a lot of these companies that are doing an ICO don't want to go through those requirements. Uh, to be fair, most com companies doing an ICO are very small. Um, they tend to be companies that have not been around for too long. Uh, they may not even have a product. Often what we're seeing is that ICOs essentially have replaced venture capital for the for seed funding, mm -hmm. so companies that are just an idea. Um, in the ICO world, you often hear someone reference a white paper. A white paper is going to dictate what you plan on building and how you plan on building it and the team that you have. But often an ICO might be four or five people with an idea, and that's it. And what we're seeing now is they can raise a lot of money. Um, but one of the requirements of that is something called the Howey test. The Howey test is a test that you pass, you fail. And by that I mean there are four requirements to the Howey test. If you pass each one, what it means is your ICO is actually an IPO and that you have a security and you need to follow all the rules and regulations of an IPO. Uh, as everyone kind of knows, most companies don't IPO unless they're very big, which means it's imperative for these small companies to avoid passing the Howey test. So again, it's four components and if you can circumvent any one of the four, you are not a security, and you don't have to follow all of the rules and regs and do an IPO. So that's what the Howey test is. It's very important, and uh, everyone who's doing an ICO knows it inherently well, um, as well as kind of how to get around it. So Neil, um, let me ask you about each element, like all the four elements of the Howey test, and let's talk about those elements one by one, because it sounds like a lot of fun. So much fun. <laughs> so according to the Howey test, a transaction is an investment contract, contract, in quotes, if A, money is invested. So what does it mean if money is invested? Good question. So money here doesn't necessarily mean cash. It can also include something like Bitcoin or Ethereum. In fact, most people fund their ICO through an Ethereum token, which means if Michelle is doing her ICO and she, people want to buy her coins, how they buy is not a credit card or cash, it's sending her Ethereum. Uh, so money here can be you know, a credit card, it can be cash in hand, it could also be Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other altcoin, including we're seeing several ICOs using Stellar, uh, which is a different altcoin that's very interesting. Um, I have a question for you. So. Do you, does does it involve like blockchain? Do you need blockchain to do an ICO? So technically, the answer is no. Um, a lot of the companies that are doing I, ICOs have a blockchain component, mm -hmm. but it is definitely not necessary. Okay, and um, so guys, please feel free to send me your coins or tokens because I'm probably going to direct that to a nonprofit. Um, but let's go to the second element. The second element is in a common enterprise or company. What does that mean? So that's a good question. This has never been really defined by the law. Um, and there's a slight difference depending on what country you're in, U.S. versus Canada versus U.K. Um, but for the most part, how you can read this is a business. So are you giving money right, to a business? And business is broad, um, and there's been different precedents set about what that is, but essentially any kind of common enterprise, and this could include nonprofit. Um, so often we'll see ICO set up a nonprofit in hopes of uh, avoiding regulation that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work. Um, so any nonprofit or normal business will fall under this category. Okay, and then let's go to the third element, which is the investor expects profits from the investments. Yes, this is the key one. If you want a loophole in the Howey test so that you can do an ICO and raise a lot of money very quickly, this is the one you want to go to. Um, it's also the most controversial. So what we're seeing here is companies are not saying, oh, please invest in the Michelle coin because it will go up a thousand percent, which some ICOs do, very honestly. Instead, what they're saying is, oh, this is something that 
uh, has a utility. So you'll hear the, the term utility token. What that means is it's actually good for something. So it's not just profits on Michelle's future salary, it's time with Michelle. So it has a good associated with it. And because of that, the you know there's no expectation of profits from buying this. You're buying it because it has utility in and of itself, um, which is why you're buying it. When we work with companies, we see this one is the exception to the Howey test they're going to most often. I wanted to expand on a little bit of the Apple analogy because I, I kind of like it. And, you know, I'm a foodie and I love to eat. So every time someone talks about Apple, I think about health and I think about food. Um, so there's a farmer and he grows apples and he owns land that grows the apples. So when he sells the land, he gets you know, uh, a return on the land because the land can grow and get and go up in value. Uh, but if he sells apple, then and he sells it to me, I basically just kind of eat it on the spot. You know, and so the apple is gone; it has no more value, right? Would that would would that be a good analogy? Yes. So, um, if say again, so say you, Michelle, are having an ICO for time spent yourself. Mm-hmm. Once someone buys your coins and, you know, gives them to you to spend time with you. Once they're gone, they're kind of spent. They're done. Um, so, yes, once the apple is eaten, there's there's only so many bites to it, and then it's gone forever. Correct. So, time spent is kind of like eating an apple. Um, and since that doesn't, um, that is not like land or stock, um, it would fall outside of that definition and then number d which is the last element is the profit comes from the efforts of someone other than the investor yes so what we're seeing here is that uh, you will typically invest in a company that's doing an ico or is a company you're going to do an ico and people want to buy these coins so that they go up in value but there, the people who are buying the coins aren't involved in the day-to-day running of the company. Um, so, which is typically what happens, right? Uh, no one kind of brings in outside people <laughs> to run the company for them. Thus, this is one where you know someone's going to buy your coins, but they're not going to really be part of the business. So, this one often, this is probably the most common thing that always passes on companies' Howey tests. So Neil, um, since you're here, let's do some disclaimer. So we're not uh, um, we're not giving legal advice. I suggest that if you want to do an ICO, um, you consult an attorney um, specific for specific to your situation. And um, how about you, Neil? Like, do you have any disclaimer that you wanted to disclaim? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I am also not an attorney. This is not legal advice. This is just information that could be useful. I am an attorney, but I'm not giving legal advice. Um, so I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to clear these so that we can kind of go on and really talk generally about ICO and compliance. Um, so, how do companies set the expectation that purchasers should not expect to profit from from the ICO? That's a good question. So again. Uh, there's four parts to how we test. The one that's the biggest kind of loophole, as you will, is the expectation of profit. Mm-hmm. So this is how you avoid passing the Howey test in being security is you you forecast or broadcast to the market that there's not going to be an expectation of profit. Mm-hmm. So there's a few thing, few ways to do this. One is you're talking about the utility of your coin. So you're talking about what it can do, that it has value in of itself or accomplishing something. So a coin could represent, in your example, an apple. So wherever you one coin, it represents an apple. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something good there. Likewise, what you don't do is say certain words or imply certain things. So you don't say things like profits. You don't say things like dividends. You don't use any of the code words that signify that the price of the coin will go up. Um, that the person will make money. So, so when is, when, when you say what we can't say, w- do you mean that like when companies when they wanted to implement an ICO, they should not put those words in the marketing material and set the expectation with consumers um, that they are expecting a profit? Is that correct? That's exactly correct. Awesome. Which is interesting because when I talk to companies who are doing an ICO, every for-profit company. Even nonprofit companies want their coin values to go up. 
Um, so how it works, for example, is that if Michelle did her ICO, she would probably release, so she would probably create, you're talking a random number, 100 million coins. And she would sell 30 million at the coin offering. She would retain 30 million to work with, uh, to essentially to help partnerships and pay for partnerships. And she would retain maybe 40 million uh, within her own bank with the idea that they would appreciate so companies want these coins to appreciate, and the investors want these coins to appreciate, but you can't explicitly say, buy these coins, they're going to appreciate. So it's kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge world of, we think they're gonna go up, and you think they're gonna go up, but we're not gonna say that explicitly, and we're definitely not gonna say it in marketing materials, because then the SEC can very easily come in and say, oh, this actually, you know, you're, you're not doing well for the Howey test. This is an expectation of profit. Therefore, you are a security. You're also an unregistered security, which is very bad, which typically means if you get caught doing that, you're going to have to return all the funds plus a huge amount of legal obligations plus the money you spent doing the ICO. So it's very onerous and not something you want to do. You definitely want to make sure ahead of time that you're not saying certain words and that you are saying other words so that you're broadcasting to the world that you know there's not an expectation of profit, therefore we're not a security, therefore everything is above board. Whether or not that's true, you definitely want to broadcast it. Yeah, I think I think I want. I mean, from the from the sen- standpoint of of the SEC, um, I think you know there's a lot of the government just wants to protect consumers and their expectation, right? I mean, I think and transparency, I think is kind of really important what the government wants to do. I mean, you know, it's, it's public good and public safety and, and making sure that our investments are transparent. Um, and so when we do invest in stock, you know, it's everything is up there. And I mean, companies, public companies need to file SEC uh, filings and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so I, I don't think, you know, startups, you know, probably don't want it to circumvent that. They wanted to really implement an ICO correctly, right? And to do it correctly, um, you know, just want to make sure that the intent and the marketing and everything is done so that consumers are not deceived. Um, so so besides marketing and the white paper, you know, and, and um, setting the expectation for consumers, what else do they need to do to comply? So one of the big things for compliance is kind of the regulatory stuff. Um, and by that, I mean there's there's risk and compliance obligations that any company has if you're accepting funds. So whether you're Indiegogo or a company doing an IPO. So what that means is, for example, is you have to have everyone who, everyone's name who's sending you funds, and you need to screen them against different lists, what we call sanctions lists, to make sure that you're allowed to do business with them. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about US- those one by one, um, because, you know, I love those. They're kind of fun. Um, you know, of course, you know, like, number one, okay, number one is the sanctions list. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about the do not do business list, <laughs> and where, people, where can people find them? Yeah, so the do not bu- do business with is, uh, and it varies by country, obviously, uh, but the U.S. government has a site uh, through U.S. Treasury, and there's something called the OFAC list, which is various countries that uh, U.S. customer or U.S. companies or U.S. individuals cannot do business with. An example here would be something like North Korea or Syria. Um, neither of these countries can you do business with anyone in the country, just full stop. U.S. government does not allow it. As such, you need to screen all of your customers if you're doing an ICO to make sure they're not coming from this from either of these countries. And there's a, a small list of countries. Uh, likewise, other countries will have these same rules where you are not allowed to do business with someone from a different country. Um, so it's really important to know right up front, you know, which countries you can't do business with. So those are the kind of the do not do business with. Yeah, the next it- layer, though, is... So I just wanted to just add a little bit there. So that list is called the embargo countries list. And then there's like the deny people's list. And then there's, you know, basically a general, more of a general list of people that you can't do business with. And go ahead, Neil. Right. So I was just going to say exactly that, which is there's countries you can't do business with. There's also individuals you can't do business with who are not necessarily from those countries. They can be from a multitude of countries, including the United States. But they are a list of people the U.S. government says you cannot do business with. As such, you also need to screen all of your ICO customers against this list. Um, so not just which country they're coming from, 
which also entails if you're if you're clever kind of making sure the IP addresses are not from those countries um, but also again making sure that people uh, are not are not from one of these lists because you will get in very very big trouble um, if you violate this even if it's something innocuous that you think like an ICO the US government does not agree there's a whole hotline you're supposed to call in fact if you have one of these people trying to do business with you so the US government takes it very seriously and you need to as well Okay, so so let's two. Let's go into the KYC stuff. Um, you know, one of the other thing that I love is KYC. So KYC. I think you mentioned it. I'm just summarizing it for you. So what is KYC? <laughs> Good question. So KYC <laughs> is know your customer, and it's one of those things that you just need to know who you're doing business with. Um, so how do you know that if someone on the internet is who they say they are? And that's what you, as an ICO, you need to make sure that the customer is who they say they are. So if I, for example, steal Michelle's name and I know her address and I say I'm Michelle, well, I'm actually not Michelle, right? I'm Neil. Um, so as a company doing an ICO, you have an obligation to validate that the customer is who they say they are. And there's different ways of doing this. Um, everything from you know checking social security numbers to looking at people's driver's licenses or passports. Um, different ways to making sure that someone you know is who they say they are and that someone you want to do business with so do you think that when companies implement an ICO um, in order to comply with KYC and also the embargo list I'm sure there are more that we're going to speak about you know do you suggest that they speak with a law firm or a compliance firm like identity mind global so you should definitely speak with a law firm um, so I am not a lawyer, and you should definitely speak with one if you're doing an ICO to make sure that you know kind of the key questions to ask. Um, so, for example, the, the, what we talked about earlier, the whole question of this security versus the utility coin, it's very important and it's really good to have a, law, a lawyer's opinion on that. That way, if there's any issues, you can always point back to what the lawyer told you. Um, likewise, lawyers are very important for the idea of kind of taxes, which we haven't discussed already, but is very important. Um, and by that, I mean, if you are a US company and you have an ICO and you raise, for example, $10 million, and I raised $10 million today in November 21st, well, in the US tax code, that, that counts as revenue, which means by March of next year, I need to pay between 30 and 50% of that to the US government. So that's between 3.5 and $5 million. It's a lot of money. Um, so lawyers will help you with the tax, essentially uh, organizing for tax purposes. So we see two big things there. We see lawyers helping you, helping companies go to you know Switzerland. Uh, Zug Switzerland has a tax rate of 13% in their canton. Uh, Cayman Islands also has a very low tax rate. So likewise, see if you know you can figure out spin up a nonprofit somewhere to further reduce taxes. So lawyers do a great job usually. Uh, helping companies who are doing an ICO answer those two questions, you know, am I a security, which is the Howey test we talked about, and, you know, where should I, where should I incorporate so that I don't have to pay between 35 and 50 percent of my taxes almost immediately to the U.S. government? It's a huge obligation. Um, again, if it was 10 million raised, you're talking between 3.5 and 5 million. If you are raising 100 million dollars, which some ICOs do, then you're talking between 35 and 50 million dollars. It's a lot of money to spend without a lot of return. So lawyers will help with those two areas, and I think they're very important. So Neil, I think we, you know, spoke about some of the compliance issue. You know, number one, we spoke about you know the, the do not do business list. Number two, we talk about KYC and a little bit of compliance um, pertaining to KYC. Number three, talk about taxes. So number four, I mean, number four, I wanted to ask you: is is AML pretty relevant to ICOs? Ooh, good question. So AML or anti money laundering is relevant, and here's why. Um, so ICOs raise a huge amount of money um, now where I think I was looking, you know, at this year they've already raised over $3 billion. And what you'll see is that companies can raise money through an ICO in the tens of millions of dollars, sometimes hundreds of millions, in a very short amount of time. Um, so Brave had it raised $35 million in 30 seconds. Wow. Um, which is a great amount of money, right? It's amazing. 
when would it? It's a great way to launder money as well, <laughs> because what you can do is send huge amounts of money instantly uh, anywhere in the world, and you have this thing where it's a you know it's a great way to move large amounts of money quickly, and without a lot of peering eyes. Um, and that ICOs raise money and people kind of expect that and no one looks too closely into where the funds are coming from. So what we're seeing is that companies are starting to get really interested and governments are starting to get very interested in tracking who's contributing and what the purpose is um, because this is a great, great vehicle for laundering money. So so when we talk about AML, um, you know, what goes into my mind is like, what are some of the red, red flags? Like how 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 do people know if you know you know of course you know you can talk to lawyers right and then they're like they're gonna advise you on AML, AML and compliance and all that stuff. So like what is what are some of the main red flags you know that that you can tell when someone's laundering money and who I mean I guess you, you should contact your attorney if if, if you see a, one or two of these red flags. Yeah. So. Uh, what we're seeing with our clients is they're very concerned about certain ju- certain jurisdictions mm-hmm. um, where money is coming from because certain ones are just definitely high risk. Uh, the other thing one of the things they're concerned about is that uh, sometimes one person will create multiple accounts uh, to contribute to your ICO. Mm-hmm. So rather than just setting up one account, I'll set up 15 accounts and put in slightly smaller dollar amounts in hopes that I don't attract attention, Mm -hmm. that is one of those things that's very curious, right? Um, Because again, if I can, I can kind of launder money through an ICO. So if I, you know, spend a million dollars, for example, and I break it up into smaller chunks, then I get a million dollars of coins, Mm -hmm. I can then sell those million dollars and my money is essentially laundered. And this can happen in a very short amount of time. So it's a really clever way of laundering money in fact. Um, but if I was trying to prevent it, uh, what we see is, you know, flagging transactions from certain jurisdictions mm-hmm. and definitely flagging users who are creating multiple accounts or who are connected. So sometimes it could be not just me creating multiple accounts, um, but someone with my same device or my same geography doing doing that, where I you know, yeah. control many. But, um, so having that kind of uh, insight at the beginning is very helpful for detecting suspicious activity, um, and if you can detect it, you can you know block these potential contributors. Um, because often, what happens with an ICO is that you will raise money, you'll get receive money, you'll give someone a token, and then they're gone, and you have no real way of communicating with them again. Um, which is really awkward if you suspect they, have, you know, they're laundering money. Because if a regulator asks you, you know, what what do you think? and you don't know who they are and you don't have any way of getting in contact with them and the money's gone, that's a very difficult conversation to have. So, so I mean, there's a long list of red flags and I think um, that's why it's important for companies to Im- who want to implement an ICO to contact their compliance firm or their attorney. Um, I wanted to move into SARS, S-A-R-S, <laughs> and it's related to, to AML and compliance. Um, can you tell us a little about, about SARS and whether you know, a person, who a, an entity who wants to implement an ICO, do they have to comply with that and actually complete those? Ooh, good question. So a SAR, for those that know, is a suspicious activity report. Um, we actually have this baked into our platform where awesome. if you are a financial institution that's, uh, that's registered with FinCEN as a money transmitter, you have an obligation to, or financial institution, excuse me, you have an obligation to tell the U.S. government that something suspicious is happening. Um, and so how you communicate to the U.S. government is something called a SAR or a suspicious activity report. Um, I have not seen ICOs conduct SARS, mm-hmm. the reason that they are usually not registered with FinCEN, mm-hmm. um, but it would be, that would be probably the way to, to communicate to the U.S. government, um, you know, suspicious activity, because you definitely should report it. Um, I don't think I've seen it yet, but it doesn't mean it shouldn't happen, it just means not being used. Um, I mean, ICO is pretty new, so I, I don't think that a lot of companies have really thought through... Um, or some of those, some of these items may not have come up yet. Um, but I'm just asking, just ahead of the future, <laughs> like maybe one yeah, day no. if, if it's required, then you know, then we may have to do it. Right, and I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea about ICOs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, again, it's it's a way to raise money anywhere in the world 
in a short amount of time, much faster than venture capital. And for something that didn't exist, literally exist, started really in 2013, so in four short years, um, you know, now seed funding, there's more seed funding through ICOs than there is through venture capital. Essentially, I think it's $3 billion has been raised this year alone. It's going up at a progression that's uh, the classic hockey stick. It's an amazing way for companies to raise money, and they should not be afraid of it. In fact, there's probably no easier way to raise a large amount of money, especially if you don't have an existing product. Um, and you don't have to be in the United States. You don't have to be in Silicon Valley. You can be, you know, we've, we see a lot of teams that are coming from Estonia and Eastern Europe. Um, so you don't have to have gone to the right schools or be in Palo Alto, even uh, we are, um, because it's a very democratic way of raising a lot of money very quickly. So it's really interesting from that component. Um, but it is brand new, and there are definitely growing pains. So, so I think I think uh, before I wanted to talk about um, specific purpose and utility for ICO. I wanted to finish the compliance part of it since the topic here is ICO and compliance. Um, I know we spoke about you know the do not do business list. We spoke about KYC, and then we talk about taxes, and then we talk about um, anti money laundering, and then we spoke about. Um, SARS, um, whether we need to comply with that. I, I wanted to touch a little bit on privacy, right? And um, is there any privacy compliance issue uh, with regards to ICOs? Yes, there is. Um, so one of the big requirements coming for companies doing an ICO is something called GDPR, mm -hmm. which is essentially uh, European privacy requirements. Mm -hmm. These are arguably the strictest in the world, and if you are a U.S. company, or any company really, um, that is holding European data, you have different privacy standards that you need to comply with. Um, so, for example, say you have contributors from Europe, that totally makes sense. Um, what we typically see from our clients is that they'll receive contributors or people buying their, their coins from about up to 100 countries, um, and Europe is very active. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're holding European data, though, there's a different set of requirements. Um, so you need to explicitly tell them, for example, that you're holding their data, what data they're holding. Um, there's a question regarding right to erasure. There's a whole bunch of things you kind of need to know if you're holding European data uh, related to privacy. And that's where a lawyer can definitely help you. Yep, and then also making sure that your policies um, and transparent about data and how they are used. Are there any other uh, compliance items that are material that we should talk about a little? So one of the fun questions I'll chat about here is that different countries have essentially outlawed ICOs, right? Mm -hmm. So you may have heard something about China, you may have heard something about South Korea, and what we're seeing is a really interesting question. So, you know, what to do if you ha are a company and you're doing an ICO and if someone wants to buy from one of those countries? Um, you as a company have an economic incentive to accept people buying your coins because you want to raise as much money as possible. Um, but then there's a question of, you know, what are the implications? So if you are a U.S. company that allows Chinese investors, what can the Chinese government do to you personally or to your company? That's one of the things we're seeing our clients really struggle with, and it's something where knowing the law is really helpful. So knowing you know, what the law exactly says, is it illegal, for example, to, it's definitely illegal to conduct an ICO in China right now, um, but is it illegal to accept contributors from China? This is where having a legal opinion really help you. Um, same for South Korea, same for Russia. And it's always good to know the law, because then if you know the law, you know what is okay, what isn't okay, um, you can look at the risk involved in each of these countries and you can accept contributors from there. Um, so it's much better to know than just kind of blindly block. We'll often see companies just block China, um, which is not always required. So it's, it's very good to know different regulations of different countries so you can know what is okay and what isn't okay. Well, compliance sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and besides the different countries um, and and whether a, an entity could conduct an ICO there or have contributors uh, or purchasers from those countries. Um, what else, is there any other compliance um, that we should talk about? I think we've covered most everything. I think we, we covered, covered yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think we're pretty comprehensive, right? Yes. 
Okay, cool. So, so I I wanted to um, chat a little bit about um, the the specific the specific purpose and utility for the ICO because I think it, I think that is related to compliance and I think that is very important. So, what are some examples of specific purpose companies are are doing? Yeah. So, uh, usually, again, an ICO gets you a coin that has a utility. Um, so, for example, uh, Filecoin is a great example. Filecoin is a company that did an ICO and raised over two hundred million dollars. And how it worked was that I it matched essentially people who needed data storage with people who had data storage capabilities. In English, what that means is it matched people who have you know computers that aren't fully taxed with people who needed places to store their data. So it just matched them together. I, as someone who had data store, would pay you in file coins. You, who had extra storage capability, would accept those file coins um, in, in payment of uh, me using your computer. And so it just matched them together. It was a microtransaction. The amount wasn't a lot, mm -hmm. but it created a brand new market that had never really existed previously, and it couldn't exist on the existing payment rails. Credit cards essentially cost too much. So that is a kind of a great example of a utility token and that had value. Uh, it's a really interesting proposition because what it means essentially is that no matter how much data you have, you can find a place to store it easily, quickly. So um, for, for like, let's talk about some of the other specific purpose. So time with me would be a specific purpose, I guess. Like if you wanted to buy a Michelle coin, spending time with Michelle is a specific purpose. Um, how about like, buying time, like buying a token for access to my website? That would definitely work. Um, it, a, a token can be pretty much anything, it just has to have a utility to it. Um, so for example, say you are doing KYCs or know your customer validations of potential ICO contributors. My company could do an ICO and then when each, each token could get you one KYC of one contributor for your ICO. Um, you can pretty much tokenize anything, and there's a big movement in the space that thinks that tokens uh, will be the future, but we're not quite there yet. Um, just give it some time, but it definitely will be soon. Um, awesome. So, uh, in terms of, I just wanted to ask you about uh, when you when a nonprofit implement an ICO, is that different from a normal profit company? Does it have to be? Is the implementation and compliance the same? The implementation of compliance is the same. Uh, the the Howey test that we discussed earlier is very different. Um, people aren't usually giving money to a nonprofit for the expectation of profit. Mm -hmm. um, which is great. So then if you are a nonprofit, what that means is you can say, okay, we're, we're good by the Howey test because um, no one expects profits from us. Um, you still have to do the compliance. Uh, the tax implications are very different and much better. Um, the slightly more challenging part is, you know, people usually buy into ICOs right now. Um, so how it works, for those who don't know, is, you know, companies will have an ICO and then speculators will often buy in trying to buy the coins with the thought that they'll flip it later, essentially buy it for a while and sell it. Okay. Uh, when a nonprofit holds an ICO, is the speculators may not rise in or kind of come in so quickly. Instead, who's buying is people who care about the product. So it's more of the Indiegogo model where people just want to see it launch, people want to see it work. They're not expecting to make a lot of money from it. I wanted to um, end our chat with a game. Um, so this is sweet. <laughs> I just make this up like on the spot, um, but I think it's gonna be fun. So I wanted to I wanted to uh, play this game and it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna say something and you're gonna tell me whether it's a security or not a security. And 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 we are not giving legal advice, guys. You you guys gonna talk to an attorney, but this is just gonna be a fun game. Um, so let's let's you know let's let's go let's dive right into it. The right to use a system okay. and its output. I wanted to get a token from Neil for the right to use a system and its output. Is that security or not? Ooh, not unless there is expectation of profit. Okay, all right. How about how about um, you know uh, I'm gonna buy your token for equity interest. 
Is that is that a security oh, or not? So much is a security. Um, by the way, there is one exception we should get into really quickly uh, on the security front, which is there's something called a SAFT, S-A-F-T, mm-hmm. and we're seeing this now a lot, which is, say Michelle, the Michelle ICO is definitely a security, and you know she doesn't want to do an IPO though. What you can do is do a SAFT, S-A-F-T, and you sell only to accredited investors, in which case then you don't need to do an IPO. Um, it's a way to raise money without following, you know, still be an ICO, um, even if you're a security. So that's something that uh, we're seeing now where people are kind of asking us, please, please, please help us do this because we're, we don't want to, we're not a, we don't want to break the law, but we want to raise money via this way. How do we do it? So SAFT is definitely the way to do it. Um, and that just means you sell to credit investors. But sorry for interrupting the game. Let's go. Okay. All right. Okay. I wanted to buy your token for rights to access or license uh, your, the system. Oh, that's. To basically, I wanted Depending to have. What I, you're wanted to, I wanted to. I wanted to basically just use your system. Um, oh, yeah. that's good then. Yeah. That's the utility coin. That it's it's giving access to the system. How about in your opinion? Um, like, what if you're like a creditor or a lender? <laughs> you're gonna get. You're gonna buy a token, and you want it to be like. In return for your token, the consideration is is that you're like a status as a creditor or a lender. Are you going to get money with it? Because if so, yeah. I think you have an issue and you're going to be a security. Yeah, yeah. Probably as a creditor, you're going to get some money uh, with it. Okay, one last one. Um, how about... Um, how about if you are buying a token and... You have you can contribute some kind of labor to the system. So you're buying a token, yeah. Um, but you're going to help. Yeah, but you, ha- you you for the right to contribute to the to the system. Oh, interesting. Isn't that interesting? I actually don't know the answer. What do you think? Well, for me personally, uh, if you look at the Howey test, one of the element in the last one, right? Is, is effort of others. So if you're going to contribute your your labor and effort to the system, you know, uh, that means that some other people are not... I mean, you're, you're basically contributing to the system and it's just really not other people. And and the last element is the, conf- the profit comes from the efforts of someone other than the investor, right? Yeah, so there you go. You can have an ICO. And you can pass the Howey test by making sure everyone who buys actually really contributes. It's a great idea. But I think I think though that it is important um, that that everyone speaks with a lawyer. You know, of course, we're playing this game, and it, 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 the answer <laughs> I don't think it's set yet because the SEC has not come um, and has not determined this issue yet. So I think it's kind of important that everyone, you know, consult an attorney or, or ex, ex qualified experts on when they implement an ICO. Um, I have a flash of question that I wanted to ask you before we go. Um, I know it is four o'clock. Um, I wanted to ask you um, how did how, I mean? If how should they begin? How should companies begin when when they want? Should they consult um, a compliance firm like you guys? Should they talk to an attorney first? How should companies begin? Yeah, great question. You always want to talk to the compliance and the legal people before you start anything, uh, because neither of these things you can't you can't go back and fix the tax issue. If you're incorporated in the U.S. Um, you can't go back and fix that. If you are accepting contributors from a bad country, you can't go back and fix that. So the best thing is when you have your idea and you're building out your you know, your team and everything else, bring in the lawyers and bring in the compliance people first because um, they will help guide everything else. Okay, and then um, I wanted to talk about if you're a security, um, your investors have to comply with Regulation D, uh, which means that they have to be accredited, right? Um, however, if you're outside of the Howey test, do your investors have to be accredited? Uh, so it depends. If you if you are not a security for the Howey test, your investors don't have to be accredited. It can be anyone anywhere in the world, um, but. If you are a security, you definitely have to be 
have to have just accredited investors. Um, yeah, so um, that's one of the reasons I asked the question. I just want to make sure that um, that companies who wanted to put on an ICO to really understand that there are different implementations and ramifications uh, if done incorrectly. So the so the question is really how do we implement ICO correctly and and to comply with all the regulations. And um, so if if someone wanted to contact you, Neil, if they have any more questions, should they contact I- Identity Mind Global? Yes, please go to identitymind.com. Okay, um, I think uh, we are it. So I just wanted to thank you. Um, thank you, Neil. Thank you very much, Michelle. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.